Glasgow is an incredibly vibrant city with a depth of culture that few others across the UK can compete with. Glasgow is Scotland's biggest city, the uh, commercial, industrial and creative capital of Scotland. It's also a growth city, growth in the economy and the employment base and population. Queen Elizabeth University Hospital is the largest hospital site in Europe. We have a large population who are very willing to take part in research and innovation. We have well over a thousand studies currently active, supported by an outstanding research infrastructure, which allows us to use data safely and securely from patients' records through the safe haven. There's great access to clinical knowledge and expertise, people that are willing to band together and collaborate, including academics, including physicians, diagnostics labs in the NHS. In the Living Lab, we are looking to support companies to develop their innovations. There's a willingness and a real enthusiasm to work together, and that includes helping companies to grow as well. I think understanding that the future of cities depends on a really strong, innovative ecosystem System. The innovation districts are the fulcrum for that. Glasgow's health and medical ecosystem is incredibly sophisticated and the Living Laboratory offers a really interesting cross-section of disciplines and you have the real three key contributing parts which are academics, businesses and clinicians. What we call the triple helix with the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital as the focus for much of these activities. By having this strong base is starting to attract some of the world's leading pharma and biotech companies. We're very fortunate in Glasgow that we already have a highly skilled workforce. 52% of the working age population are qualified to degree level. So someone coming into Glasgow is going to find a pretty healthy pipeline of talent. But we also work actively with the college sector, with schools and with Skills Development Scotland. Glasgow is a really special environment for precision medicine to make progress. Glasgow has all the ingredients to bring investors into establishing themselves and grow in a very nurturing environment. Good morning, thanks very much for joining us. Um, really interesting topic today, we'll be looking at the life sciences side, health tech and precision medicine, um, looking at the key trends in the market, um, why it's such a big growth area, what that also means for the real estate and, and real asset side. Um, really interesting, really interesting panel. And we'll also be looking at, uh, at Glasgow as an example of that so that we can drill down a little bit in terms of some of the detail um, uh, and what that means in terms of the investment side and also the requirement for occupiers in terms of space. Um, but first of all, um, what I'd like to do is, is just um, introduce um, Ivan McKee, MSP, who's Minister for Trade and Investment and Innovation in the Scottish Government. Um, thanks very much for, for joining us, um, Ivan. And Ivan's now going to give us a, a brief welcome. Thanks very much, Ivan. Hello, and welcome to Investing in Health Tech and Precision Medicine. Scotland's health innovation is globally recognised, and our ambition to continue to build on Scotland's strengths in world-class research, infrastructure, manufacturing, high-value supply chains, and partnerships for mutual benefit with health and care services. On 31st of January, Expo 2020 in Dubai, a digital health and wellness activation day promoted and showcased Scotland's growing innovation and expertise in the digital health ecosystem. The programme of events highlighted our vision for the future of healthcare priorities and the key role data intelligence and the work of our innovation centres have in helping us drive that ambition. Our international investment plans identify health tech and life sciences as sectors where Scotland has a real comparative advantage and marked to strong global demand. Our inward investment plan details how we will use our natural assets, proven skills and established infrastructure to support investors who share our values and ambitions to expand and grow their operations in Scotland. It outlines a new strategic focus for attracting inward investment to Scotland taking an evidence-based approach to identify the opportunity areas where we will concentrate our effort. It's no surprise that health tech is one of those key opportunity areas where we believe we have significant global strengths and the potential to attract even more inward investors, creating new and high value jobs and helping the Scottish economy. Our global capital investment plan sets a national strategy that will mobilise the public and private sector parts of our ecosystem to use our resources and levers 
where we can have greatest impact to attract growth capital for Scottish businesses building clusters in the sector. Scotland's a long history of innovation in healthcare and a rich talent pool in academic excellence in digital health, data analytics, AI and other key specialisms. More than 7,000 people work in health tech companies across Scotland and our universities and colleges produce a strong pipeline of graduates with relevant skills every year. As well as making a vital contribution to Scotland's economy, our collaborative approach to innovative health tech has made a major contribution to the global response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Our life science sector has contributed to the health uh, test supply chain and to vaccine and therapeutics development. There is strong global demand for targeted therapeutics, a new generation of healthcare delivery that is well suited to Scotland's regional strengths and our world-class clinical and research assets, including Glasgow's £1 billion Queen Elizabeth University Hospital campus and the Living Lab, which is the largest investment in the UK for precision medicine. A unique triple helix culture of collaboration between business, academia and NHS Scotland helps support a thriving health tech industry and a proud history and heritage of innovation in medicine and a wealth of expertise in relevant technology puts Scotland at the forefront of this dynamic, important and fast growing sector. I truly recognise the strength Scotland has in health tech and precision medicine and I hope you enjoyed today's event and I very much look forward to hearing the views of the speakers and audience on this important and growing sector. Thank you. Great. Um, really interesting. Thanks very much um, for that, Ivan. Um, really interesting to see how important this is also um, in terms of the, the Scottish Government. Um, Carol, it would be interesting to get from you. Um, obviously, we've got a super panel coming up, um, but I've, I've I just wanted to introduce Carol um, Clugston there, who's going to give us a kind of brief overview um, in, in terms of what's happening there in, in Glasgow, um, the Living Lab. I know you've got various different uh, different hats, Carol, at the University of Glasgow, um, but it'd be good just to just to get, a, I suppose, some insights in, in terms of um, particularly the, the precision medicine side, the life sciences side, and, and just for those people who are less familiar with it, um, get, get, I suppose, an, an update on, on what this means, Carol. Delighted to do so, Richard. Thank you. So Glasgow has got a proud history of innovation. It was a pioneer of the first industrial revolution. And Glasgow is now transforming itself to play a leading role in the industries of the future. The Living Laboratory for Precision Medicine is using Glasgow's existing strengths in precision medicine. That is the University of Glasgow's internationally leading researchers, our strong life sciences industry base, our largest health board in the UK, to develop innovative products and services which will support Scotland's economy, reshape people's lives for the better. Precision medicine brings more accurate diagnostics and treatments that are tailored to individual characteristics rather than populations. Precision medicine is often thought of as, as genomics, but it's far broader than that. Indeed, the approach that we are taking in Glasgow is applicable to the development and the adoption of a very wide range of innovations in healthcare. This provides a game-changing opportunity for Scotland, and particularly for Glasgow. I'm going to the brief overview to set the scene for our expert panel discussion. Over several years, precision medicine has been a catalyst for the development of Glasgow's strong triple helix partnership working that you heard, you heard mentioned in the introductions. That is bringing together academia, industry and our NHS. And that partnership working now extends to Glasgow City region and to our communities and across Scotland. Working with NHS and Glasgow City Region, we've invested in infrastructure for research and innovation at the £1 billion Queen Elizabeth University Hospital campus, which is Europe's largest university hospital and is part of Glasgow's growing Riverside Innovation District. We created our clinical innovation zone for industry, 
embedded in that hospital campus. And that now has 14 tenant companies embedded there, including large companies such as Canon Medical and and smaller companies that have joined us from California, Germany, and Singapore. And you will hear from one of these companies, uh, Bioclavis, um, in the panel discussion, and also from the Precision Medicine Scotland Innovation Centre, which also will be our clinical innovation zone. And these strong partnerships really are the foundation of our recent successes. In 2019, we carried out a science and innovation audit on behalf of the UK government. This was important as it demonstrated that the global market for precision medicine is growing, perhaps even exponentially growing, and it's estimated to be worth $134 billion by 2025. The science and innovation audit evidenced Scotland's strengths and in particular, the opportunity for Glasgow to attract a share of this global market. However, it also identified the challenges of adoption and of mainstreaming of innovative technologies into healthcare. And that's particularly true when these technologies are disruptive. And it was, it was understanding both our strengths and challenges that led to the development of the Living Lab for Precision Medicine. And I'm, I'm delighted to be the director um, of the Living Lab, which, um, which, as Mr. McKee said, is the UK's largest investment in precision medicine, totaling over £90 million in this programme alone. Building on Scotland's £1 billion investment in the Queen Elizabeth University um, Hospital campus, our aim is to address the challenges of adoption of healthcare innovation and take the promises of precision medicine into a real world clinical setting. The Living Lab brings together a consortium of leading organisations across industry, NHS Scotland, academia and others. And we're using our collective strengths to develop, validate and support the adoption of new technology into health. The Living Lab investment will also expand our hospital campus and our new health innovation hub will bring additional purpose-built space for new companies with facilitated access to world-leading researchers, including data scientists and engineers, as well as the best clinicians and Scotland's rich health data assets. We've got an ambitious, an ambitious vision to grow the life sciences cluster around the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. And our consortium partner, Kandan Science Partners, is with us on the panel um, today. If I can get the slide to move, that's us. So um, moving on to the, the, the projects and what we're actually what we're actually doing as part of the Living Lab. We have got a variety of multidisciplinary exemplar projects already underway. And these range from advanced imaging project projects, for example, um, seven Tesla MRI coil development um, and radio genomics, through to um, projects around um, pharmacogenomics and transcriptomics. These projects are designed to enable um, the adoption of new technologies, support companies and researchers to develop new innovations, and also to build assets for Glasgow and for Scotland. These projects are exemplars. They're really interesting in, 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 in their own right, um, but we're also keen to support new projects using the assets that we're building. And as part of our expanded campus, we are also creating a new digital health validation lab where digital innovations, including apps, devices, and sensors can be developed, tested, and validated, importantly, alongside researchers, clinicians, and patients. And I want to touch just briefly on the Lighthouse Lab in Glasgow. At the start of the pandemic, we were able to quickly draw upon our partnership working with industry and the NHS to develop a COVID, a COVID testing lab from scratch. 
And this very much came out of the partnership um, building that, 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 that we've been working over, on over the last few years. And working with, uh, with, with Bioclavis that are here today, we ramped this up to become the UK's largest COVID testing facility, which has now analysed over 25 million COVID tests, as well as increasing our understanding of COVID biology and supporting vaccine trials. And we've been doing that by working in partnership with, with, with researchers and with the NHS. And importantly, over the last 18 months, we have trained and upskilled over 800 staff and these are now a valuable asset to Glasgow and to our growing industry cluster. So I want to finish just with a, a, a brief um, summary of, of, of why Glasgow. Well, firstly, we have got the best of the UK's research and clinical excellence. And that's been demonstrated over the last couple of years through our role in the pandemic. Our partnerships with the NHS and with industry are genuine. And I hope that you will, you will hear that and get a sense of that when, when, when you hear from our panel. We also have this significant skills base um, going from right through from our schools, our colleges and our universities, and, and also now from, um, from, from the upskilling that we have done through the Lighthouse Lab. And our investment in the Living Laboratory is accelerating the development of our ecosystem for precision medicine to benefit companies, our NHS, and importantly, our patients and communities. And finally, something I haven't touched on yet, but the, the, the Living Laboratory in the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital is situated in Govan, which is an area of high deprivation, but has got huge opportunities for inclusive growth. And I would draw your attention to the UK's levelling up paper, which was which was um, um, came out just a few days ago, where importantly Glasgow was chosen as one of three cities across the UK, which was ripe for significant government government investment in innovation. So to finish, I'd like to invite you to join our vibrant precision medicine cluster in Glasgow. The Living Laboratory is open to new collaborations to support economic development and provide benefits to patients and the NHS. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Carol. Really interesting. Um, let's, um, let, let's now just go to, um, to the panel. Brief introduction. Let's start with you, Carol, actually, because you didn't introduce yourself there. So quick introduction from you. Um, and then, uh, then, then we'll move on to, to Marion Harper and Emma. So, so Carol, just a brief introduction of, of yourself, please. Very brief introduction. I wear, I wear many hats um, within the University of Glasgow's College of Medical Veterinary Life Sciences. Um, I'm Dean for Corporate Engagement and Innovation, and I'm also Chief Operating Officer. Um, but um, for, for, for the last um, just over a year, um, I have also been directing the, 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 the Living Lab for, for Precision Medicine. So, so my role is my, my role is very externally facing, and I'm pretty passionate about um, about what we're going to be able to achieve in in, in Glasgow. Great, thanks very much, Carol. Um, over to you, Marion. Just a, just a brief introduction of yourself, please. That would be great, and and also Precision Medicine Scotland. Thank you. Yes, I'm Marion McNeil. I'm the Chief Executive of Precision Medicine Scotland's Innovation Centre, and that Innovation Centre has been established now for about seven years. And Carol was instrumental in helping set that innovation centre up, actually. And um, we're based at the Clinical Innovation Zone at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital and um, hosted by the University of Glasgow. But we're actually a consortium of all the medical health boards across Scotland and their associated academic partners. Um, and we have some industry partners there on our consortium as well. And what we've been set up to do really was initially do some exemplar projects to prove out about what is possible in precision medicine and particular disease areas. And one of the things we want to highlight is our next stage now is looking at how to help translate that into the NHS, bring benefit to companies and industry who want to maybe move to Glasgow or establish themselves in Scotland and to run more exemplar projects. And we're a key partner in the Living Lab, which again, like Carol, I'm really excited about because I think it's an opportunity to show this in um, real life patients and work with real, you know, actual change happening that we'll be able to visibly see and measure. Um, so I'm very excited about the future. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Marion. Um, uh, let's let's come to you as well, Harper. Um, just a brief introduction of, uh, of, of yourself and the company. That would be great. Thanks. 
Yeah, sure. Um, so my name is Harper Van Steenhouse. I'm a neuroscientist by training and have uh, had a career in a number of different biotechnology startup companies, uh, primarily in marketing and new technology commercialization, um, mostly focused around genetic technologies and, and bringing new things to market. So BioClavis is a company um, that's, uh, as alluded to by Carol, has been set up here in Glasgow as a spin out of a sister company in California. We set up the business over here uh, for sort of two reasons. One, um, we needed uh, closer access to Europe. Um, I was tired of waking up at three in the morning for phone calls. Um, and then uh, we also have, uh, uh, you know, core business reasons. So we're a diagnostics company using the technology invented in California, but applying it for lower cost, higher throughput diagnostics, kind of pushing the limits of what can be done in a more practical sense, um, rather than necessarily pushing the limits of, uh, you know, the, the research grade uh, clinical work that can be done. And so Glasgow has been a great place to do that. And you see in my picture here, we're located right there on the campus of uh, one of the largest hospitals in the world, uh, certainly the largest I've ever seen with an amazing biorepository and good colleagues such as Carol and Marianne and, uh, and several others. Um, and so we're doing all this diagnostics work as well as servicing our European customers from this site. That's super. Thanks very much. Um, and uh, Emma, over over to you. Just a, an introduction of yourself and the company would be great. Thanks, Richard. And good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Emma Goodford. I'm a proprietary partner at Knight Frank. We're a real estate uh, advisory business. We're a global firm. Um, we have about uh, 16,000 people um, across 350 offices, uh, including in Scotland, in Glasgow, um, Aberdeen and Edinburgh. Um, and, and all the major UK cities, of course. Um, my particular responsibility is focused very much on the southeast and the Golden Triangle area. Um, and on a day to day basis, I advise in the development, leasing uh, and occupier advisory area. Um, in the US, we now have a partnership with Cressa, um, who have offices, of course, in San Diego, uh, Boston, Cambridge uh, and San Francisco, the cornerstones of, of the life sciences sector. Um, and I'm part of their life science practice group. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Um, Emma, let's 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 start with you, maybe. Oh, and um, just for everybody watching, the joy of these things being live is that, of course, we can um, take your comments, take your questions. I can see there's already some comments in the in the comments side. So do pe please put those in. Um, it's just on the right hand side of your screen and we'll make sure we pick those up and answer them. Um, Emma. A lot of discussion there, both in the introduction, actually, from um, Minister McKee, but also from Carol, just about the, the growth in this area. Um, I, I suppose what, from your point of view, is really driving that growth? It, it, I mean, it, it's, it's been an unbelievable, I suppose, 24 months for the sector, um, but, but it's much, much deeper than that. You know, the pandemic, and excuse the pun, has given it a, a huge shot in the arm. Um, but, but frankly, it is deeper than that. Um, I, I think when we look at it, we, we could reduce it down just to the data um, and venture capital funding, which obviously is a proxy for company growth um, and the sector activity generally hit record levels last year in 2021 uh, at about £5.6 billion. Pounds. Um, that was about a 50% increase on 2020. So it just showed the volume, if you like, of cash flows actually going into the industry. Um, a second marker would be, for example, incorporations in the sector. Um, there were over a thousand life science business registrations last year. Um, five years ago, that was 450. You know, so two metrics that just show um, incredible dynamism uh, across the sector, uh, even before you start getting into things like M&A activity and IPO activity, um, the amount of vacancies in the sector. Um, job vacancies were up 58% in 2021, you know, showing the sort of voracious demand from companies in the sector for talent and, and I think you know particularly the importance of talent um, and the opportunities in the UK to, to provide those talent pools to to companies. Um, and do, do you think it's really made a huge change um, just just in terms of the the, the focus on uh, on Covid um, or you know has that really been driving forward prior to the pandemic so um, I mean, where do you see that kind of pre and post pandemic? Well, it's a good question. I mean, I, I am regularly asked, is, is the boom that we've sort of witnessed in the life sciences sector akin to the technology bubble that we saw at the very end of the 90s? 
Um, and my response to that typically is um, that was a sector that pretty much came out of nowhere. And we have to remember that the life sciences sector was an incredibly established sector right across the UK prior to COVID. Uh, we've just had this incredible acceleration and, and it's probably coincided with a, a lot of digital and technology transformation that, that has really enabled the sector. OK, great. Um, it would be interesting just to get, I think, um, from you, Harper, um, just your sense, obviously, uh, as, a, as, a, as a company operating in this area. Um, what have you been seeing in terms of that growth? And I suppose where, where do you see this this heading? Yeah, the I mean, um, we've seen a couple of doses of growth like this in in um, my history, especially in California. We had um, in in I guess the early two thousands or so, um, very similar trends here, fueled slightly differently, as we would saying, a whole lot of money going toward COVID uh, based activities, which then spill over and, and enable a lot of companies to invest uh, that revenue for sort of more long term core aspects of their business. What we've seen um, then, you know, following on those trends is what we would expect, frankly, which is getting harder to hire and retain employees um, massively in America. Um, it's, it's slightly easier over here. We've been able to hire pretty well um, in Glasgow, but um, it's getting more challenging. Um, add on top of that uh, inflation concerns and those sorts of things, and that drives uh, salary uh, demands upward, of course. Um, and then the common theme that I think we've heard from from a lot of groups, um, we're we're generally doing okay on space, but um, we're growing very quickly, as are a lot of firms, and a lot of companies are having difficulty finding the amount of space they need. Um, certainly much more challenging than um, it was five years ago. Um, and so those are, you know, maybe maybe not um, too surprising, but they're definitely hitting us as an industry right now. Okay, good. Um, it'd be interesting to get your perspective, uh, Marion. We've obviously heard from Carol specifically there about what's happening in, um, in Glasgow. Um, but from your perspective, looking at it, um, across Scotland, and I suppose you've also then got, you know, some perspective as well on what's happening in in other countries, but particularly across Scotland. Um, what are you seeing as as the sort of key trends here in in, in this sector? So I, I just backing what the others have said, really, in terms of the growth has been accelerated by COVID, but I think it was there anyway. I think we've learned to be really flexible and pivot and, and adapt. And technologies that would have come anyway have just been brought forward quicker. We've really opened our eyes. And I think the Lighthouse Lab in Glasgow is a really great example of how we can very quickly pull together and find a solution and then bring in the right skills and workforce. And one of the things that we do as an innovation centre is we support a master's programme specifically on uh, precision medicine. And that's to bring in, again, more you know, highly skilled workforce that are ready to take on the challenges for this area, because this area is not just genomics. It's actually all the different factors that feed into it. So it's imaging and, you know, data and IT platforms to analyse that data and bioinformaticians and things like that. So we're a very well connected ecosystem. I mean, Scotland's population is just over five million. So somebody said to me, it's the perfect study sample because we're very well connected. And then every patient has this chi number that links all their data. So, again, it makes it very easy to do you know, rapid research in this area. And sadly, we've also got a high incidence of complex diseases, chronic diseases. Um, so it makes us, again, quite a good place to build data sets and, and analyse that information. So, um, yeah, I think it's, it's a great place to come and, and see the flexibility and what we can produce. Um, and from your point of view, Harper, um, I mean, Marion there mentioned, obviously, the sample sizes, but also that, that idea of being able to collaborate um, how important is that for you? Because it's interesting to get a sense of that, I think, particularly for companies and occupiers um, in terms of what's driving your decisions about where to locate and the type of space that you need. For us, it's critical. Um, we have a, uh, a neat technology um, and that's our core expertise, but uh, we don't pretend to be experts in all the clinical areas where we're trying to solve problems. Um, and so we really depend on those collaborations with, with the clinicians that are located in buildings like these, um, as well as strewn about the university um, for early stage uh, discoveries to make it through. 
And so um, we've been really happy with, with this situation in Glasgow. And, and it was something we sort of stumbled upon early on before moving. And um, it's really proven itself out. Um, I come from you know San Diego, where um, arguably you've got uh, one of the biggest clusters of, of a lot of biotech happening. But the level of collaboration, the level of interaction, the level of uh, sort of mutually beneficial win-win situations. Um, Glasgow is uh, just excellent for that and, and really um, holds its own despite being smaller in size, quite frankly. The other thing that's really impressive to me is just the, the, the quality of um, scientists coming out of the university, coming out of the other companies. Um, you know, it's, it's always, the industry always gets a little... Um, uh, uh, sharing of resources, but here in Glasgow, um, it's, it's, uh, I think a more sustainable and, um, a, a more friendly environment. We, we're always going to lose, um, employees to other companies and those sorts of things, but, um, it doesn't feel cutthroat in that sense. And so all of these different aspects, um, all together, I'd sum it up with, you know, basically people in Glasgow and, and Scotland, from my experience, are genuinely interested in, in the overall good, the greater success of the area, because we kind of recognize that's going to be beneficial to all of us. Um, and Carol, do you, do you get the feeling, I mean, obviously we had the introduction there from Ivan McKee. Um, in terms of, um, I suppose, driving livability, wellness, those kinds of things, which are very important in terms of, and I'll come to you in a second on this, Emma, but very important in terms of investors looking at investability of cities in general, but also about retaining talent and those kinds of things so that Harper actually has the kind of employees that he's looking for to take it forward. Um, how important, I suppose, is that is creating the right infrastructure? Um, obviously, we can use Glasgow as an example, but this will be the, the, the same case for all cities. So I think the, 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 the infrastructure is more than the bricks and mortar. And, and we're we're really, really fortunate now in Glasgow that we've had such a huge investment in, in, the, in the physical infrastructure. But it's also about that. It's, it's, it, it's, it's about the softer infrastructure. It's about the culture that we've developed, that real, um, real genuine strength of partnership that's coming through. And, and one of the things that I think I've noticed over the last couple of years, particularly with, with, with the pandemic, is that it's really helped us cross across sectors and not to stay in our not to stay in our own in, 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 our, in our own bubble. Um, I think that you know the, the pandemic has helped us reach out to you know to engineers to to lots of different disciplines and realize that actually. We're, we're all working towards a common goal. We've all got different things to contribute, but working together is, is, is just so important. And, and, and the other thing over the last couple of years that I think has been increasingly true is that, is, is that young people now see medicine as much broader than just becoming a doctor. You know, young people now understand that it does take a multidisciplinary approach and you can, you know, you can be a data scientist or you can be an engineer or you can, um, you know, you, you, you can be somebody who's, who's, you know, who's, a, who's a process, um, you know, in, in engineer or expert. And, and so we're getting a lot of interest from, from different sectors coming together, which is really adding to the rich um, talent base that, you know, that, 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 we, that we have in Glasgow. And, and of course, we, we, we not only have a lot of graduates coming out of the, the, the university, and as Marion says, we've got, you know, we've got some really kind of specialist programmes which are, which are truly excellent and, 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 and sector leading. Um, but we've also got really good relationships with, with, with colleges and school sectors and, and really thinking about how we bring more young people um, in, into this area. So I, I know I've gone all, maybe gone off your question slightly, but to me, it's all about, it's not just about the hard infrastructure, it's about the wider ecosystem that we're creating. No, that's really interesting. Um, and I'll pick that up with you in a, in a second. But just, just a reminder that um, there is now the presentation from Carol is in the files um, on the right hand side of your screen. So you can download that. And, uh, and thanks uh, to Gavin and, and others for putting in different links as well there for, for those who are interested in that particular side of it. Um, Emma, just, just coming to you, just picking up that point as well around um, 
uh, I suppose, talent, um, but also what cities are needing to do to be able to track that. Um, but also I wanted to pick up with you just where I suppose life sciences sits because you're looking at the office sector overall. So do you see this as a kind of tiny niche area of, of office? Um, is it something that's going to be growing into its own kind of subsector? Where do you see it at the moment and how do you see that, that going forward, Emma? Yeah, I'm going to start by stealing an expression that one of my clients uses, which um, when he talks about the sort of real estate aspect of providing bricks and mortar to the life science um, sector, he says they don't do real estate, they build communities. And, and I think you know that's a really important thing for developers and investors in the sector to, to really put at the forefront. Um, so this, this this triple helix of, of academia, um, of NHS and of the sector, the operators in the sector is, is an incredibly important factor for everybody to keep sort of front of mind. Um, and I, I think at the moment we have a weight of money coming into the sector. They've seen massive growth. They've seen, Harper mentioned it, enormous inflation, you know, both in terms of the input costs as the investor buying either bricks and mortar or land for development. Um, and a few of them have been tempted to stray perhaps away from those places which are going to be delivering the best result, um, uh, it, whether it's performance um, or, or, frankly, the best result for the, the businesses that need to be based there. Um, so I think um, I, I think. What we will see um, is is a continuation of um, specialist locations which have that triple helix opportunity rising and, and those other locations which don't really provide that, frankly, not able to create a niche for the life sciences sector. Um, I think we do. We are we are just at that point where inflation is going to be a great concern. I mean, there was a transaction that was committed last week in Oxford um, at 24 million pounds an acre. Now, that is probably. I could say 10 times the sort of price that would have been paid uh, ahead of the last 24 months and, and, and the huge expansion in, in interest in this sector. Um, and that, of course, will then feed through to inflation on rents uh, and create potentially, I think, issues for the occupiers coming in to take uh, accommodation uh, in that sort of location, in that type of prime location. So from your point of view, Emma, does, does that mean that there may be a, <clears throat> you know, a, a slight focus away from some of the golden triangle aspects if we're if we're looking at the uk particularly here um that sort of golden triangle and to more kind of uh of the regional cities but obviously understanding what you're mentioning there about the the triple helix element well there's two things i think that play into that i mean firstly and carol mentioned it there is the the government's leveling up agenda um and their focus on putting you know i think 40 percent um of increased money into the r d sector by 2030 and, and obviously that money coming in from government is going to be matched against private investment that's made in those locations. So th there will inevitably be investment that will be made outside of the southeast. Um, and I think, secondly, there is the, um, the spatial arrangement of the workforce in the sector. Um, there's about 280,000 people employed in the sector very broadly across the UK. 50 percent of those are employed outside of London and the southeast. So, you know, you, you have got balance. Um, but but I do think it, you know, where these where companies want to go will will be those locations where that triple helix ecosystem exists um and i think it will become much more difficult for those who if you like um are looking to ride the real estate wave of value creation it will become much more difficult for those locations perhaps to really establish themselves without that access to a brilliant nhs hospital and without that access to academia well, that's interesting. Um, and Marion, I wanted to, to pick up with you. You mentioned in previously that that focus on innovation. Um, I suppose how important is that as a as a as a component, um, particularly for this sector, that that link in with innovation and, and innovation districts, perhaps as well. Yes, thank you. I, I guess that comes down to something that um, Carol's mentioned is about the support that we get from government which helps support there for the innovation that people have these amazing ideas. You know, sometimes an idea is somebody's out for the weekend on their cycle or something and they have a, a brainwave, but how did they get it to market and how did they make it become a reality? And one of the things that, you know, the, the team here in Glasgow, and I call us a team because we do feel like we work together even though we sit in different sectors. So I have this network, which sounds kind of cliched almost, you know, like we used to network face-to-face -face at meetings, We've actually got an incredible network where I know I can pick up the phone to a decision maker in the NHS and ask their advice about technology that somebody's brought to me. And I'm thinking, where's the best place to next go to and how do we make that happen? So innovation is fostered here. 
and we don't just think about it but for us for instance if somebody approaches us with an idea that's not specifically just for our innovation centre we're well connected into all the innovation centres in Scotland now the Scottish government invested in those seven years ago and the UK government have identified precision medicine as a high potential opportunity and then you overlay that on top of that the investment in levelling up and the innovation you know zone that they want to create for science in general in, in Scotland and I think Scotland really is going to rise you know higher and higher in people's awareness I hope about actually what it feels like because we don't just talk about it it's real we actually have those connections and those links that we can bring to life for people whereas I've been to other centres that will show you a very glossy you know outside approach and it looks very beautiful and you think oh yes I'd love to be based here but the reality is they're not so well connected sometimes because they've been too focused on their own you know what we're trying to do whereas in Scotland we take a much more holistic approach about what's the overall benefit to the economy what's the benefit to the people that are coming here and how do we help them stay I mean Harper I would say when I first met them they came to sort of view Scotland and with other places that they were looking at and one of the things we wanted to make sure is he left feeling like he was a friend that, you know, there's that opportunity and, I'm, I'm, and he's smiling now because he's probably going, no, not really, don't like you guys. But it's that whole kind of we want to build those relationships because that's what will carry us forward. You know, it's that looking out for each other. Harper, you can come back on that if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I mean, we're great friends. I mean, even <clears throat> even um, when it's not directly related to business, um, brainstorming this sort of innovative idea generation stuff. Uh, I mean, it's a great environment around here. Um, Mary and all of our colleagues. Um, and it's, you know, just to expand a little bit, there's, you know, innovation is hard to force. But without an environment that fosters it, it also won't flourish and it won't grow. And so you, you have to have this sort of necessary but not sufficient environment. And, and that's what we found here in Glasgow. We've got the driving force. We'll push it forward. But we need an environment. We need the people. We need the um, uh, you know, sort of location to access markets. We need um, sample access, clinical expertise, those sorts of things. Um, and with that, then we can take our little spark of brilliance added into everybody else's and uh, the whole becomes much greater than the parts. Can, um, can, I, add, can, can I add in just, just another thing I was thinking about there just now when, when Marion and Harper were, were speaking and, and something about our location is the, the accessibility and the affordability of it and I think that also sets us apart from, from, from some of the kind of golden triangle, for example, lo lo locations. And, and, and an example of that has been the, the you know, the, the, the Lighthouse Lab and COVID testing centre. We've been running that 24-7. We've got 800 staff and we're running it 24-7. And all of these people can get to that location. It's all within easy, pretty much easy commuting distance for them living. And I think one of the things that companies have been finding very attractive about locating in Glasgow is the fact that they've not only got access to the talent pool, but that talent pool can afford to live here and that they can that they can commute very, very easily to their, you know, to, to their place of work. And I think that that also plays into the plays into the mix, um, the mix of the location as well. And, and that allows us, if, if, if you don't mind, it allows us as employers then to both attract and, and retain staff, but Frankly, they're happier. Um, people can afford to live. Uh, scientists can afford to live even earlier in their careers um, in Glasgow, have a great lifestyle, have a great place to live. In San Diego, I won't lie, it's pretty hard to own a house and uh, have a good lifestyle on a you know, entry level technician salary, those sorts of things. And it's really, uh, it's really difficult. And so that's absolutely, it's one of these sort of um, smaller factors, maybe when you're looking at the big picture, but it's really important for employees and employers. And, and Carol, just coming to you, obviously, what one of the challenges maybe um, is, Harper mentioned there, is space um, and the space to grow. Um, in what you're doing there in Glasgow, how much opportunity is there for, for that, that kind of growth, I suppose? How do, you, how do you plan for that whilst also still keeping that collaborative element? So, so, so we, um, we, we set up our original clinical innovation zone a few, day, a few years ago. That was the University of Glasgow that, 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 that did that. Working with the NHS, we've been very forward looking and allowed us to actually bring industry right into the heart of the campus, which is pretty, pretty unusual, not sitting in the outskirts, but actually right in the middle of the, of, of, of the campus. 
Um, but we did that not because the university wanted to be a landlord, far from it. We did that because we wanted to have the benefits of the relationships and the partnerships. And that is really, really, as, as we've heard, really shown, show, shown itself to be successful. So what we're now doing through the investment in, in the living laboratory is that we're now working to really expand that campus and to create more physical space. And we're really fortunate that, um, that the location of the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital has got a lot of land around it. And so we're we're working with Cadans that hopefully are going to be going to be joining us in a bit to, um, to, to, to design and build more purpose-built space. And that again, we're, we're working to make sure that that space is not just a building. I mean, it's going to be a super amazing building, but what we want to do within the building is be able to facilitate the relationships working. So make sure that we've got the access to the clinicians, we've got the access to, to, to researchers. So, so, so it will have a it will have a an ethos that will help us continue to grow and develop that um, that, that that ecosystem approach that we're that, that we're building. And and, and Kadans and see who are, are partners in that are very much of that mindset. So it's been a it's real been a real meeting of minds when we um when, when, when we started working with Kadans. So so we're as I say, very, very ambitious around what we would like to do in the future. The, the, the building that we, we've, we've already got underway um, is going to be hopefully the first of many, um, because as part of the, as I mentioned briefly at the, at, at the beginning and the, the earlier presentations, we are part of the Glasgow Riverside Innovation District. So we're sitting on, we're sitting on the Clyde. Um, the city is building a new bridge across the Clyde, a walkway, which is going to be connecting us with the west end of Glasgow, which is which is the location for one of the universities or the main university campus there. So that's going to be a very, very quick way for us to be connecting researchers with with, with the hospital. I mean, it's at the moment if you're if you're driving or cycling, it's it's, it's literally kind of like ten to fifteen minutes away. But the creation of a the creation of a of a new bridge is going to bring that is going to bring that 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 even closer. So so working with the city and and an building the, the the innovation district is really going to enhance um, access to the access to the site and also to the you know to, to, to the buildings themselves um, and Harper and that's interesting about that hard infrastructure as well that that's being built there Carol um, uh, Harper just just from your point of view um, maybe looking at, at what you're doing but also at other companies in the sector um, because it's a new area for a lot of people in terms of this life sciences side, um, how data intensive is it? Um, is it a mixture of sort of traditional, what people might view as traditional laboratory, or is it more data center or, you know, I, I suppose, what's the makeup of it? Yeah, it's kind of all of the above. And, and it, it goes along this theme um, just to kind of maybe not to put words in Carol's mouth, but she sort of alluded to this. The university is sort of optimizing for innovation and growth rather than optimizing for landlord ownership, property development, that sort of thing. And, um, you know, that that what that means is um, it, it becomes a a, a really good landing spot for us. We started with four people that I hired here in Glasgow and myself, and we've grown to 30. And the university has been flexible with us all the way through and making sure they can support that as we grow. Our needs grow in terms of space, in terms of infrastructure, what we need. The um, things like access to data centers, it started out, we had one server and now we have two racks of servers. Um, being able to grow like that um, and start small, but uh, to be able to support us in that way has been a real advantage that we've had. Um, there's other things that, you know, just by being on the NHS campus, we have security, we have um, uh, amazing transit links, we have um, <clears throat> sort of, you know, rubbish uh, and, and other utility uh, stuff that we just don't have to think about, um, which We'd rather think about science, frankly, um, especially in early days when I when that's all we should be thinking about. Um, and then the other thing that that it really added was a layer of credibility to us as a new company. Um, I was able to have you know big big name companies as potential customers or or early customers come and visit us, and um, it it adds a layer of um, impressiveness and uh, stability that 
you know, a brand new company wouldn't necessarily have otherwise. So um, we also benefited from that. And, and that's something I think the whole industry benefits from by uh, showing this sort of stability and, and ability to grow. Um, companies generally don't want their vendors to disappear on them overnight. And so showing a strong community where we all support each other is also good for business. I'm good. Uh, Emma, I just wanted to come to you on um, picking up how you think investors see that element, uh, because Harper mentioned that there's, you know, there's elements of data center, there's elements of, of traditional lab within that. Does that make it more complicated for investors, you think, to, to see the opportunity? Um, or is that just a question of, uh, I suppose, uh, the educational piece, people learning more about it from, from people like Knight Frank? <laughs> What's the, you know, where... <laughs> I, I, I think what investors have realised in this sector is that the role of place is incredibly important. And um, I think, you know, both Harper and Carol mentioned this ability to create a place where you can accommodate um, startup businesses right through to established players um, is, is the ideal ecosystem, if you like. It, you know, if you've got a, a large enough holding to be able to do that um, and an investment strategy that allows you to, to, to create that, um, that would be ideal for, for this particular sector, pretty much in any location. Um, so, so I think, um, you know, yes, there are certain specialist aspects, you know, the, the pull on power, you know, and data storage, et cetera, is, is absolutely understood. Um, and that doesn't exist across the piece. You've got, you've got to understand, you know, what your utilities provision is, et cetera. Um, but, but I think, you know, as I say, role of place is really important. And I think we are beginning to see a shift. Um, you know, the sector initially, I suppose, established itself predominantly on edge of town uh, campus environments. And I think we've seen over the last two or three years an acceptance that the urbanization of the center is now becoming more important. Um, and that's that's partly to do with transport and access. It's partly to do with, I suppose, the walkability that we saw because of COVID, everybody wanting if they could to be able to walk or cycle to their place of work. Um, and I think that will increase and, and that will put, you know, that will put different pressures, I suppose, on particularly developers and investors in terms of how they develop in more urban districts to provide for the sector. Um, the logistics around the sector is is the operators in the sector, you know, can be quite complicated, which is part of the reason why campus developments work best. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I think a, an expert and a, a proper knowledge of the sector and what the occupiers need, what the universities interacting with them require, how the NHS hospital environment again interacts with that is, is you know, you have to bring all these components together as you begin to develop a life sciences cluster. Oh, and Carol, do you, do you see that? I mean, that's interesting that, um, so A, in a way, you've either got to create, make the clusters more, you know, where they are, a larger part of the, you know, of an area of, you know, add livability and those kinds of elements to it, or you've got to begin moving them closer into the, to the city centre. Um, how do you deal with that, Carol? So, I mean, I think we've got the we've got the best of both worlds. I mean, we, we obviously have naturally built around the hospital campus. The, 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 the um, Scottish government investment in, in, in that hospital, which I think was tw was was 2015 when it when, when, when it opened, that provided a real opportunity for us to turn, you know, what was the you know Europe's lar largest hospital into the the go to place for you know for, for for innovation, particularly in the precision medicine space, and 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 so that was that became our centre of gravity. That became where we where, where we put our focus because we really saw the we really saw the opportunity. But the location of that hospital is is just superb. I mean, we're we're less than ten minutes from um, from um, Glasgow International Airport. We're less than ten minutes from you know from from the university's main campus, which in itself is 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 going through a, a, a huge a huge expansion. Um, and we're another ten minutes from 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 Glasgow city centre. So so we we've got we've we've got a. It's just a great, a great location, but because it's in because it's in Govan, which is you know which is not the leafy suburbs, it's 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 it's, it's you know it's, it's, it's an area that is ripe for development, which means that there is that, that there is land that we've been that we've been able to use to you know to, to to expand. So so from that point of view, it's given us both the opportunity for the future, but also been able to harness the strengths that we've got of of, of that location. And that's and and 
Emma, just from your point of view, um, are you seeing, I mean, we, we've been following quite a big um, focus on purpose-driven investment, impact investment in general from uh, the large capital sources beginning to look at these particular areas. Do you think there'll be an increased focus on this as part of the office sector, maybe because it does have a, a kind of social impact side to it as well, um, given that it's in the healthcare sector? I think investors are um, becoming incredibly aware of of that side, you know, that that being sort of one of their criteria in terms of how they invest. Um, but but they have all sorts of things that they consider, you know, obviously return on investment um, being key, and and they can principally see that in the sector because of the growth um, the growth potential. Um, the other area I think that's becoming incredibly important that we haven't really touched on is the sort of environmental aspects. The S and the G absolutely understood because of the community benefits, et cetera, and, and the health opportunities. But but the environmental issues, I think, are something that investors are slightly challenged by, by the sector, because we have to acknowledge there's a huge amount of electricity consumption. There's a huge amount of water consumption in many of these areas. Um, it, it's not the most sustainable sector operationally. Um, and how that works into real assets um, will be, I think, a factor that may at some point just make people just c consider the, the the future suitability and, and growth potential. Um, but overall, um, the ESG is relatively balanced and, and certainly the community benefit, I think, is, is absolutely recognised and understood. Great, thanks. Um, we've, we've got around three and a half minutes left. Um, so I just wanted to pick up a, a, a view from from everybody. I, I suppose on um, I guess on, on where you see the opportunities um, going forward. We can look at twenty twenty two, or we can open our horizons larger than that. Um, but I suppose where are, where are the where are the key opportunities at the moment? Let, let's let's start with you, Marion. One of the, the, the big opportunities I think is just to, is to approach us with any ideas. We are very open to wanting to discuss, you know, what, what's your innovation and what do you want to help with? And one, to me, one of the biggest opportunities is the investment in the Living Lab, that you can become a partner in those projects. So we're building these real world setting projects in pharmacogenomics and transcriptomics with um, Harper's company, um, where we want other companies then to come in and collaborate on that resource we're building. So data is a huge part of something that we've really got to grips with and that Scotland is really pulling together really effectively that will give companies the opportunity to come in and use that data to prove out their innovation, to work with the development. Um, so that, to me, I think that's an area that we're leading on at the moment. And I know that's a big claim, but I'm making that claim with the sort of backup of companies that are now coming to us and are quite excited about the opportunity to collaborate. So hope that helps. Great, thanks. Carol. So for, so, so for me, immediate opportunities will be to, to, to collaborate very, very open to new projects, to, to new collaborators for um, to come and work with us in the Living Lab. In the kind of medium term, over the next four to five years, we will have our new building open and, um, and we're looking to create a lot of jobs in Glasgow, really grow the, the ecosystem from, from what is already successful, but really taking it to the next level and got ambitions really to grow um, over 500 jobs over, 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 the next, over the next kind of four or so years. Um, and then um, looking ahead, even kind of 10 years in the future, what we really want to do is to see the Glasgow Riverside Innovation District really flourishing. And we would like to see that the whole development of, of, of the Clyde is actually becomes a really huge attractive place for the for, 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 for life sciences cluster to develop even further. Great, thanks. Um, Emma, over, over to you. I think there's going to be three key elements that the sector is going to be challenged by in the next few years. One is effectively the race for space. Um, and I think that will probably result in quite a lot of repurposing of buildings um, that may provide particularly short term solutions for for quite a lot of companies. Um, I think it's going to be challenged by cost um, inflation um, because the input costs are going up. And, and I think there will at some point be a ceiling possibly on how the Occupy market responds to that. Um, and something we haven't touched on, which is sort of new wave manufacturing. Um, I, I'm always told that the, the UK and Europe don't manufacture a single aspirin. Um, and I think in COVID, we've seen the fragility of the supply chain. And, and I think around some of these life science clusters, we will see an emerging manufacturing sector develop, have to develop. Um, and how that works with the key 
um, sort of innovation and, and, and key life science regions, um, how that sort of fits in the patchwork will, will be really fascinating to watch. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point, Emma, actually, and we'll, we'll also be covering um, a, a topic around advanced manufacturing coming up, actually, because I think that's going to be a really interesting um, topic in general, particularly for the UK markets there as well. Um, and Harper, last, last word to you. I think that um, all this, everything people have said is true. And, and then, you know, from my standpoint, in terms of where we're going as, as an industry and businesses is um, using all that collaboration, all that infrastructure, all these innovations to add to productivity and efficiency. We've got a big backlog of patients that need care and there are not enough people to do it. And so figuring out ways that we can contribute to that um, as an industry and, and solve some of this manpower uh, shortfalls is a key area of growth and interest. Perfect. Thanks very much. Um, thank you, Harper, Carol, Marion and Emma. Really interesting discussion. Um, thanks to Ivan McKee also for, for joining us earlier for the welcome. Really interesting to get his perspective on that. Thanks very much for watching. Thanks very much, everybody.